mm. both you and and uh, Elon think that with AI, you're summoning demons, summoning a demon. Maybe not in those poetic terms, mm. but well, poten potentially. I mean, so potentially. Uh, two very, three very parsimonious assumptions. I think here, I mean, scientifically parsimonious assumptions get me there. Um, any of which could be wrong, but uh, it just it seems like the the weight of the the evidence is on their side. One is that it's, it comes back to this topic of of substrate independence, right? Anyone who's in the business of producing intelligent machines must believe ultimately that there's nothing magical about having a computer made of meat. You, you can do this in the kinds of uh, you know materials where we're using now and uh there's no special something that's good that 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 presents a, a a real impediment to producing human level intelligence in silico right again an assumption I, there, i'm sure there are a few people who still think there is something magical about you know biological systems mm -hmm. but um leave that aside uh given that assumption and given the assumption that we just continue making incremental progress, doesn't have to be Moore's law, it just has to be progress, that just doesn't stop. At a certain point, we'll get to the to human level intelligence and beyond. And human level intelligence, I think, is also clearly a mirage because anything that's human level is going to be superhuman by unless we decide to dumb it down, right? I mean, my phone is already superhuman as a calculator, right? So why would we make the human level AI you know, just as good as me as a calculator. Um, so I think we'll we'll very if we continue to make progress, we will be in the presence of superhuman competence for any act of intelligence or cognition that we care to prioritize. It's not to say that we're, we will we'll create everything that a human could do. Maybe we'll leave certain things out, but anything that we care about, and we care about a lot. Uh, and we certainly care about anything that that produces a lot of power. You know, I think we care about scientific insights and and you know, ability to produce new technology and all of that. Um, we'll have something that's superhuman, and then the the final assumption is just that there have to be ways to do that that are not aligned with a, a happy coexistence with these now more powerful entities than ourselves so and and i would i would guess and this is a you know kind of a rider to that assumption there are probably more ways to do it badly than to do it perfectly that, that is perfectly aligned with our well-being and when you think about the consequences of uh, of non-alignment when you think about you're now in the presence of something that is more intelligent than you are Right, which is to say, more competent, right? Unless you've, and, and, and the, obviously there, there there are cartoon pictures of this where we could just, you know, there's just an off switch, and we could just turn off the off switch, or they're tethered to something that that makes them, you know, our slaves in perpetuity, even though they're more intelligent. But that that strike those scenarios strike me as a failure to imagine what is actually entailed by greater intelligence, right? So if you if you imagine something that's legitimately more intelligent than you are. And you're now in relationship to it, right? You're in the presence of this thing, and it is autonomous in all kinds of ways because it had to be to be more intelligent than you are. I mean, you built it to be to be all of those things. We just can't find ourselves in a negotiation with something more intelligent than we are, you know. And we can't. So we we have to have found the 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 subset of ways to build this these machines that are that are perpetually amenable to our saying, oh, that's not what we meant. That's not what we intended. Could you stop doing that? Just come back over here and do this thing that we actually want. And for them to care, for them to be tethered to our own sense of our own well-being, uh, such that, you know, I mean, their utility function is, you know, their, their primary utility function is for, is to, you know, this is, I think, Stuart Russell's, uh, you know, cartoon, uh, plan is to figure out how to to tether them to a utility function that that has our own estimation 
of what's going to improve our well-being as its master, you know, re reward, right? So it's like that all that this this thing can get as intelligent as it can get, but it it only ever really wants to figure out how to make our lives better by our own view of better. Now, not not to say there wouldn't be a conversation about, you know, I mean, because of all kinds of things we're not seeing clearly about what what is better, in, in, and if we were in the presence of a genie or an oracle that could really tell us what is better, well, then we sh we presumably would want to hear that, and we would modify our sense of 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 uh, what to do next in conversation with these with these uh, minds. But I just feel like it is a failure of imagination. Uh, to think that being in relationship in relationship to something more intelligent than yourself isn't, in most cases, a circumstance of real peril. So, because it, because it is in, in in every like just to think of think of how everything on Earth has to if if they, if they could think about their relationship to us, if birds could think about what we're doing, right? They would, I mean, the bottom line is they're always in danger of our discovering that there's something we care about more than birds, right? Or there's something we want that disregards the the, the well-being of birds, yeah. and and you know obviously much of our behavior is inscrutable to them. Occasionally we pay attention to them, and occasion occasionally we withdraw our attention, and occasionally we just kill them all for reasons they can't possibly understand, but. We're, if we're building something more intelligent than ourselves, by definition, we're building something whose horizons of value and and cognition can exceed our own, and and in ways where we can't necessarily foresee again perpetually that they don't just wake up one day and decide, okay, well these these humans need to disappear. So, I think I agree with. Most of the initial things you said, what I don't necessarily agree with, in my own, of course nobody knows, but that the more likely set of trajectories that we're going to take are going to be positive. That's what, what I believe. In the sense that the way you develop, I believe the way you develop successful AI systems will be deeply integrated with human society. And for them to succeed, they're going to have to be aligned in the way we humans are aligned with each other, which doesn't mean we're aligned. There's no such thing, or I don't see there's such thing as a perfect alignment, but they're going to be participating in the dance, in the game theoretic dance of human society and as they become more and more intelligent. There could be a point beyond which we are like birds to them. Hmm. But, and, and, but what about an intelligence explosion of some kind? So I, I believe the explosion w will be happening, but it's there's a lot of explosion to be done before we become like birds. I, I truly believe that human beings are very intelligent in ways we don't understand. It's not just about chess. It's about mm. all the intricate computation we're able to perform, common sense, our ability to reason about this world, consciousness, I think we're doing a lot of work we don't realize it's necessary to be done in order to truly become, like to truly achieve super intelligence. And I just think there'll be a period of time that's not overnight. The overnight mm. nature of it will not literally be overnight. It'll be over a period of decades. So my but, sense but, is- But why would it be that way? But just take, uh, draw an analogy from recent successes, like something like Alpha Go or Alpha Zero. I forget the- the actual metric, but it was something like this algorithm, uh, which wasn't even totally, it wasn't bespoke for chess playing, in the matter of, I think it was four hours, played itself so many times and so successfully that it became the best chess playing computer. Not only was, it was not only better than every human being, it was better than every previous chess program in a matter of right. a day, right? So like that, like, so just imagine, again, it, we don't have to recapitulate everything about us, but just imagine building a system, uh, and I mean, who knows when we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do this, but at some point we'll be able, at some point the, the hundred, our hundred favorite things about human cognition 
will be analogous to chess in that we will be able to build machines that very quickly outperform any human and then very quickly outperform the last algorithm that perform outperform the humans like something like the alpha go experience seems possible for facial recognition and detecting human emotion and natural language processing right like well it's it's, it's just it's it's just the we everyone you know even math people math heads tend to have bad intuitions for exponentiation right I mean, we noticed this during covid I and mean, we have some very smart people who still couldn't get their minds around the fact that you know an exponential is is really surprising i mean things double and double and double and double again and you don't notice much of anything changes and then the last you know two stages of doubling swamp everything right and um, it just seems like that to assume that there isn't a deep analogy between what we're seeing for the more tractable the tractable problems like chess to other modes of cognition it's like once you once you crack that that problem it seems because for the longest time it was impossible to think we were going to make headway on uh, in ai you know it's like a, chess a, and go was uh, go was seen as yeah go, go seemed unattainable even even when chess had been cracked go seemed unattainable mm-hmm uh-huh. Yeah, was, uh, and actually, Stuart Russell was behind the people that were saying it's unattainable, right? Because it seemed like a you know it's a intractable problem. Right. But there's something different about the space of cognition that's detached from human society, which is what chess is, meaning like just thinking, having actual exponential impact on the physical world is is different. I I tend to believe that there's for AI to get to the point where it's super intelligent, it's going to have to go through the funnel of society. And for that, it has to be deeply integrated with human beings. Hmm. And for that, it has to be aligned. But I mean, so, you're talking about like actually uh, hooking us up to like the neural link, you know, we're, no, no, we're no. going to be the brainstem I, to the <laughs> well, that's ro- a possi- robot overlords. That's a possibility as well. But uh, what I mean is in order to develop autonomous weapon systems, for example, which are highly concerning to me uh, that both US and China are participating in it now, mm-hmm. that in order to develop them and for them to become, to have more and more responsibility to actually do milita- military strategic actions, they're going to have to be integrated into human beings doing the strategic action. They're going to have to work alongside with each other. And the way those systems will be developed will have the natural safety like switches that are placed mm-hmm. on them as they develop over time, because they're going to have to convince humans. Ultimately, they're going to have to convince humans that this is safer than humans. They're going yeah. to, you know. You, well, so, well, self-driving cars is a good test case right. here, because like we're, we're obviously we're, we've made a lot of progress and we can imagine what total progress would look like. I mean, it would be amazing. And, and it's answering, it's canceling you know, in, in the US 40,000 deaths every year based on ape-driven cars, right? So we, it's a, it's an excruciating problem that we've all gotten used to because there was no alternative. But now that we can dimly see the prospect of an alternative, which if it worked in a super intelligent fashion, yeah, maybe we, we go down to zero highway deaths right or you know certainly we go down by orders of magnitude right so maybe we have you know 400 rather than than 40,000 a year right um and it's easy to see that there's not an a missile so obviously this is not an example of super intelligence this is narrow intelligence but um the the alignment problem isn't so obvious there but there's there are potential alignment problems there. Like so, like just yeah. Im- just imagine if some woke team of engineers decided that we have to tune the algorithm some way. I mean, there there, there are situations where the car has to decide who to hit. I mean, there's, there's just bad outcomes where you're going to hit somebody, right? Now we have a car that can tell what race you are, right? So we're going to build the car to preferentially hit white people because white people have had so much privilege over the years. This seems like the only ethical way to kind of redress those wrongs of the past. That's something that could get one that could that could be, get produced as an artifact, 
presumably, of just how you built it, and you didn't even know you engineered it that way, right? You, right. you, 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 you cause it. machine learning, yeah. you, you, you put some kind of constraints right. on it to where it creates those kinds of outcomes. You, you, you basically you, you built a, r a racist algorithm and you didn't even intend to, or you could intend to, right? And it would be aligned with some people's values, but m misaligned with other people's values. Um, but it's like, th there are interesting problems, even with something as simple and obviously good as self-driving cars. But there's a leap that I just think it'd be exact, but those are human problems. Mm -hmm. I just don't think there'll be a leap with autonomous vehicles. Oh, oh, first of all, so, sorry, there are a lot of trajectories which will destroy human civilization. The argument I'm making, it's more likely that we'll take trajectories that don't. So there, I don't think there'll be a leap with autonomous vehicles will all of a sudden start murdering pedestrians because once every human on earth is dead, there'll be no more fatality. Sort of unintended right. consequences yes. of, and it's I difficult to take that. that leap. I, most systems as we develop and they become much, much more intelligent in ways that will be incredibly surprising, like uh, stuff that DeepMind is doing with protein folding, even, which is scary to think about, and I'm personally terrified about this, which is the engineering of viruses using machine learning, mm -hmm. the engineering of uh, uh, vaccines using machine learning, right? The engineering of, uh, yeah, for research purposes, pathogens, uh, what, using machine learning mm. and like the ways that can go wrong. I just think that there's always going to be a closed loop supervision of humans before they before the AI becomes super intelligent. Not always, much more likely to, to, to be supervision. Except, of course, the question is how many dumb people are in the world? How many evil people are in the world? My theory, my hope is, my sense is, that the number of intelligent people is much higher than the number of dumb people that know how to program, mm. and uh, the number of evil people. I mm. think smart people and kind people over outnumbered right. the others. Except we also we, we had a, have to add another group of people, which are just the the smart and otherwise good but reckless people, right? The people who will flip a switch on not knowing what's gonna happen. Yeah. They're just kind of hoping that it's not gonna blow up the world. Yeah. We already know that some of our smartest people are those sorts of people. You know, we know we've done experiments, and this is something that Martin Rees was whinging about before uh, the Large Hadron Collider got booted up, I think. Um, we know there are people who are entertaining experiments or even performing experiments where there's some chance, you know, not quite infinitesimal, uh, that they're going to create a black hole in the lab and suck every you know the whole world into it, right? I mean, like that. That's not. That's not. You're not a crazy person to worry that. Don't worry about that based on on the physics. And so it was with with uh, you know the Trinity test. There were some people who were still checking their calculations, and they were off. We've we've we did nuclear tests where we were, we were off significantly in terms of the, the yield, right? So it was like- And they still flipped the switch. Yeah, they still flipped the switch. And and sometimes they flipped the switch not to win a world war or to or to save 40,000 lives a year. They just- Just, just to see what happens. Intellectual curiosity. Yep. Like, this is what I got my grant for. This is this is where I'll get my Nobel Prize if, if uh, that's in the cards. It's on the other side of this switch, right? And- um, I mean, we again, we are we are apes with egos who are massively constrained by self, very short term self interest. Even when we're contemplating some of the the deepest and most interesting and most um, universal problems we could ever set our attention towards, so I, like just if you read James Watson's book, The Double Helix, right about the, the, them, you know, cracking the the uh, the structure of DNA. One thing that's amazing about that book is just how much of it, almost all of it, is being driven driven by very apish, uh, egocentric social concerns. Like that, the algorithm that is producing this scientific breakthrough is human competition. If you're James Watson. Right. It's like I'm going to get there before Linus Pauling, and you know, it's just it's so much of his bandwidth is captured by that. Right now, that you know, that's that becomes that becomes more and more of a liability when you're talking about 
producing technology that can change everything in an instant. You know, we're, we're talking about not only understanding. You know, we're, we're we're just at a different moment in human history. We're not when we're doing research on viruses. We are now doing the kind of research that can cause someone somewhere else to be able to to make that virus or weaponize that virus or or um it's just a i don't know i mean I, I, our power is our wisdom is it does not seem like our wisdom is scaling with our power right and like that yeah. that seems like in so far in so far as wisdom and power become unaligned i, I get more and more concerned